getting a computer case ready for your components is actually not complicated. Uh, it mostly comes down to making sure that things that should be on the case before the parts go in are on the case. Out of the box, the half XP is going to come with three 120 millimeter case fans, two on the front, one of which I've already removed, and then one on the back. This is probably enough for most people to get started, especially for a mid-range PC with more efficient hardware. But I'm setting this computer up to do heavy-duty video rendering and 1440p gaming. So the combination of those two plus the multitasking workloads that I'm expecting with live streaming are going to put a lot more load on this system than is typical. So to prep this case, I'm going to pull off the stock fans that it comes with and I'm going to add my own fan package to uh, essentially lay a foundation for expansion in the future. When you're setting up a computer case, um, fans are typically easy to repair and replace even once the case is fully assembled. But since I'm still waiting on a whole bunch of the other core components, but I have the fans now, I figure it's probably better to just front end everything and, and put in those critical components that I know are not going to change even if I have to order different kinds of hardware later. Now, the half XP only comes with these three basic fans, but it has mounts for a whole lot more. The 120 millimeter fans on the front can be upgraded to 140 millimeter. The rear has to stay at 120. It doesn't have any mounts for anything else. The 200 millimeter fan on the top is a Noctua, while the rest of the fans are all Arctics. These are all four pin PWM fans that are able to give better feedback to the system as to how hard they're working. And the Arctic fans actually have the ability to shut completely off if you want to, which I like because depending on the system load, it may not even be necessary for these side fans to spin. In the setup that I have, the Noctua 200 millimeter fan is going to be the primary air mover for airflow through the case. The CPU and GPU are going to have dedicated fans, which will also likely always spin just due to the idle loads. But this guy is going to be responsible for taking the heat that those core fans extract and get them out of the case. I'm experimenting a little bit and I have no idea if this is going to work. Um, typically when you use airflow coolers you set them up in push configuration because static pressure is supposed to make it better. I'm not entirely convinced that that's always the case and even if it isn't and I suffer some small reductions in efficiency, I prefer to pull air through heat sinks where possible because it gives you a chance to trap dust against whatever screen that you're pulling the air through. So for the fans that are going to go on the outside of this case, I'm going to be maintaining a pull configuration. So these fans on the front are going to pull air into this central space where the motherboard, CPU, and GPU will live. And the rear fan, rather than exhausting as is typical, I'm actually going to set up so that it's blowing air into the case. So we've got three fans that can pull air in, and then we've got the Noctua, which I don't have a choice. I have to mount in push configuration. It's going to sit on the bottom of this mesh screen, and it's going to push air out, up through the top of the case. As these components get hot and begin rejecting heat, that heat will naturally want to rise up through this mesh grate. The 200 millimeter Noctua fan will help accelerate that process and, as a consequence, will pull air in naturally through all of the different ports where the fans are already sitting. If I get it right, and assuming there's enough airflow, the 200 millimeter fan might just move enough air so that only the CPU and GPU fans need to turn, and then these case fans will only spin up under heavy load circumstances, which should keep the system quiet and should help preserve a little bit of power, but also make sure that these fans don't wear out as quickly. Now, the reason why I want the Noctua 200 millimeter fan to be the main source of case airflow is because a larger fan will always move more air at the same RPM than a smaller sized fan. And that frees you up to run lower RPM fans at a larger size that will make less noise. So if this works the way it should in theory, 
this Noctua fan will be able to move a ton of air at you know 25 to 50 percent throttle and will make less noise than any of these other fans would at the same setup. If I can get the entire case to run on this and the CPU GPU fans only, I would consider it a massive success with these other fans being regarded more as supplemental cooling available when needed but ideally not required in most situations, especially if I'm only doing audio recording or other types of voice work where I don't need to load the system all the way down and I don't want the fan noise to potentially contaminate my audio. Now, one other side note, because I know that I'm gonna get comments about it by somebody, is that I have explicitly avoided RGB components in most of the selections that I've put on this case. I think the only components that are gonna have RGB are gonna be a little bit on the motherboard and then the GPU that I've selected because it's not available without RGB configurations. But pretty much all the other parts on the system are going to be just the essential components necessary to get the performance that I want. I'm not big on lighting my computer up like a Christmas tree and especially not big on having it flash pretty colors late at night while I'm trying to sleep. Sure, I could turn the RGB off, but I've had a hard time with most RGB control software on previous custom builds that I've put together. And it might work for a while, but it's just such a fuss. I would rather not deal with it because I know this computer's gonna live in my house. It's probably not gonna get shown to people very often. And when it is, the RGB just isn't a big enough pull for me to want to spend extra money making my computer look prettier. This is a machine that's going to help facilitate my hobby and hopefully at some point in the future be a source of revenue generation. So I'm thinking about this from a practical perspective on building a machine that is for work but also facilitates having fun. So sacrificing RGB makes sense for me in that case. But it might not make sense for you. If you really want to set up a conversation piece, then all power to you. There are a ton of great looking systems that people have put together that are for show. Most custom PC building companies lean into the aesthetics really hard because it does actually help them sell hardware. People do care about how things look, but well, I guess I'm an outlier. I would rather just have it work really well and not worry about selectable light colors. So one of the cool things that the Half XP is capable of doing that you don't see very often in computer cases is that it lays the motherboard flat on the second deck, leaving the lower area down here open for your large format hard drives, your power supply, which goes here, and in the back, if I can get enough of this out of the way, you have two, you have a hard drive rack with two removable shelves. Now I've ordered an extra shelf that should be here soon, and that extra shelf is going to allow for the potential of four SATA style SSD or compact HDDs. Now I'm going to put solid state drives in here and not disk based hard drives because they're quieter and this shelf is mostly going to be used for what I would call medium term archival storage. But one of the unique features that this case has on the front is this rack right here which is able to fit these hot swap hard drive trays. These I'm actually going to use for backup drives. So when they're slotted in, you have two hard drives sitting in the front here and they have the ability to act as my system backup. My plan is to order two really high capacity hard drives and run them in a RAID configuration for redundancy. So I think that's RAID 1. And that will basically ensure that everything that's stored on my high performance M.2 drives that are on the motherboard and on the SATA SSDs that I'm gonna have on the drive rack in the back, all of it's going to be backed up to two redundant front facing hard drives. I've heard people say that hard disk drives are on their way out and well, I don't know if that's true or not, but the fact remains that they are um, pound for pound, one of the best value memory per dollar spent options on the market, but it comes at the cost of memory speed. 
You don't want to game on a hard drive with a, a disc platter because the responses are so slow that especially for modern games, which were designed around higher speed memory, you're going to end up with huge performance issues. Older games, like Skyrim, for example, that were made in an era where solid state drives were less common and more expensive, they actually designed that game around the idea that most of its players would be playing on hard disk drives. Well, as a result, Skyrim has loading screens and other little tips and tricks to make sure that it's able to deal with that lower speed memory. But newer games, you don't really have a choice. Now, the primary purpose of these hard drives is not to store working memory. That's what the rear drive rack is for. These drives are only here to allow me to maintain a full system image backup of my computer, which can be regularly updated. And one of the cool things about these uh, drive trays is that by flipping this little switch here and flipping the rack out, you can pull the backup drive out in a couple of seconds. And that's important because if you're regarding your backup drives as you should, they should never remain connected to your computer when you're not running a backup. And that's because if your computer is ever compromised by, say, ransomware, you don't want your backup drives where the ransomware can get to them. So you only connect the memory, your backup memory to the computer for the purpose of running a backup and then you remove it. So well, around about once a week, probably on Sunday, all you do is you hook these bays up, you close the rack down. Once the computer has mounted the drive, you run the backup, whatever software you want to use, or just use the Windows inbuilt stuff. And then once that backup is complete, you remove the drive and store it somewhere. Or if you're feeling particularly less than fancy, you can just have it sit like this in the drive tray, but not actually connected to the computer. In either case, you're keeping with the spirit of separating your backup memory from your active working memory. Now, one of the advantages of getting the fans and everything set up first is that it gives you an idea what your cable management environment's going to look like before you add the motherboard. Now, you could just as easily do the motherboard first. So, me doing the fans first is more a reflection of personal taste and availability of parts than it is of anything else. But it does help me, at least, visualize what my wiring environment is going to look like by doing this one chunk at a time, taking a step back, and potentially ordering cable clips or wire guides or other things that might be necessary in addition to the other parts that I've got still coming in on Amazon. Now, as an additional step, while I'm installing these new fans, I am also going to be installing this rather unimpressive looking package of dust filters and magnetic tape. This is a, an optional step, depending on how you're setting your computer up, you may or may not need to do this. I happen to live in an area that has a significant dust problem, and during the summer it also can develop a significant ash problem, as we're close enough to California that the forest fires can occasionally make this place look like nuclear winter. So, setting the case up so that this large fan is the primary air mover means that when this fan is spinning faster than the other case fans, the case itself is going to be operating under negative pressure, and that's going to want to suck air in from any open port, both on the sides and below. To prevent dust ingression into the case, these dust filters are going to hopefully trap any debris at the screen, which I'm going to try to mount on the outside of the case where possible. And the idea here is so that I can avoid needing to blow air out of the internals of the computer uh, with computer duster. Yeah, it can be pretty tough. It can take an hour or two to try to get everything out really well, and in some cases you might have to take things apart to get all of the debris out. Preventing that problem before it starts is the better model in my opinion, and that means taking extra time while I'm setting the case up to make sure that all of the major places where air gets into the case have to pass through a mesh screen. This will reduce airflow, but with the amount of air volume available inside the case, my hope is that the airflow reduction won't compromise top end performance. Now here's a, a quick tip if you're ever working on a computer. Um, not all Phillips screwdrivers are created alike, and not all Phillips bits are the same. 
There's actually a bunch of different styles. I don't know how well this will show up on my camera, but um, I have a precision screwdriver set that I got off of Amazon. And uh, you can see here, these are a battery, a selection of common Phillips bits, and then over here it converts into uh, star bolts. Most computers are going to use you know, Phillips or standard screwdriver bits. Rarely, if ever, have I heard of a case that uses star bolts or star patterns. But if you're using a Phillips screwdriver and you are finding that as you're turning a screw, no matter what you do, the bit wants to lift and jump and uh, skip in and out of the channels on the head of the Phillips bit, it means that you have the wrong bit. And you might need to go get a different one because if you try to force these, uh, especially these smaller computer screws out with the wrong bit, you might succeed, but you're also damaging the head every time that the screwdriver jumps the, uh, the bit. So it's really important to make sure that you have the correct bit so that you don't damage one of these screws because if you, I don't know how many of you have ever had to um, try to extract a stripped bolt from a car, you have a lot more freedom to hit that with different larger tools, but if you manage to successfully strip the head off a Phillips screw in a computer, you're up a creek in a pretty nasty way because trying to get a damaged fastener out of a motherboard or other sensitive electronic component without also damaging that component is a really frustrating adventure in futility. Unless you've got the exact right tool or the exact set of specialized tools necessary to do it correctly, you know, you're going to have a bad day. Kits like these aren't expensive on Amazon. I think I paid all $20 for this one, maybe $30. But it's been a real boon when doing any kind of high precision technical repair, not just on computers, but on any electronics that you might find around your house. So if you don't have one of these kits, it's a good idea to just jump on and find one. I got the most complete kit that I could find, and I've been satisfied with the quality. It's not the most amazing tool. It's certainly no DeWalt, but it is more than adequate for the kinds of casual computer repair or, or build projects that I take on. All right, so that's all of the initial case preparations that I had planned out. Uh, new fans and dust filters will hopefully protect everything on the inside of the computer. I have no idea how this thing's gonna perform from a thermal standpoint. I'm not an expert. So once all the new components are in and I have a chance to test it out, I'll be able to gauge whether or not I need to adjust how the airflow works. Building a PC 
yourself involves a ton of trial and error, so I'm learning from this process about as much as anyone else would. I want to again repeat that I'm not an expert and I can get things wrong. So once this thing's built up enough that I can get some good metrics for testing, then hopefully I'll be able to learn what I need to adjust the airflow and maybe do some fine tuning as to how heat gets pushed out of the case. The next major step in the process now is going to be installing the power supply and the motherboard.